Hey guys, uh, today I thought I would give a presentation on yeast fermentation kinetics. And to get down to it, the objective of this presentation will be to figure out how we can model yeast fermentation kinetics as a function of cell and ethanol concentrations, glucose levels, and carbon dioxide production rates. And to go into the background behind what's going on here, it will help to take a step back. And all living cells require energy to survive. And uh, they do this via a process referred to as cellular respiration in which they take glucose and they're able to convert it into ATP, which is the universal energy carrier of all cells. And what happens in glycolysis is we end up getting pyruvate and NADH as a result of glycolysis by itself. Uh, if we were operating in an aerobic environment in which oxygen was present, that pyruvate molecule would be able to go on to the citric acid cycle to generate uh, high energy electron carriers in which we could uh, generate massive quantities of ATP. But in the absence of oxygen, or if there is an extreme requirement for ATP immediately, cells will perform fermentation. And yeast in particular will perform something referred to as ethanol fermentation, in which they take the pyruvate that comes from glycolysis and they decarboxylate it via the enzyme TPP and a magnesium 2 plus ion to form an aldehyde. And with that aldehyde, uh, the yeast are able to turn NADH back into NAD plus. And this is critical because without NAD plus, glycolysis can't continue. And so with NAD plus on hand, uh, the yeast are able to generate small quantities of ATP and continue to survive. And uh, the byproduct of this is ethanol. And ethanol is in high enough levels toxic to yeast cells. It um, stops them from being able to maintain homeostasis and these yeast cells will stop uh, growing. And so if we take a look at yeast growth phases, uh, yeast have different states of their lives in which they are uh, metabolically active or dividing. And uh, when you have a bottle of yeast or when you buy yeast off the shelf in a supermarket, you're getting yeast in a dormant phase. And when the yeast have access to uh, glucose and other nutrients, they are able to divide and metabolize uh, for all the various reactions of life. And so during this process, we see yeast entering this kind of exponential region here. And during this phase, they're metabolizing like crazy, they're generating ATP, uh, and they are doing that if there's no oxygen present via ethanol fermentation. And so the mathematical model behind these kinds of growth rates that we are observing is explained by the Minot equation. And the Minot equation by itself allows us to model how uh, cells will divide if, they're, if they are only limited in their growth by, a, by one substrate. And in this case, we can think of that substrate as glucose. However, because ethanol is toxic to these cells, as ethanol levels increase, the solution that these yeast cells are living in becomes more toxic. And that's why we need to take into account this term boxed in red here into our Minot kinetics equation, which allows us to uh, see how these yeasts are not able to thrive as the toxicity level increases. And so uh, what we did in lab is we wanted to be able to model all these kinds of parameters. And the way we did that is via apparatuses like these. And so the first apparatus is, that we used was a hydrometer. And the hydrometer works by analyzing the specific gravity of a solution. And as we will recall from the buoyancy force and Archimedes principle, the more dense a solution is, the greater weight that will be displaced by an object submerged in that fluid. And so as the density of our solution is changing, as we dissolve more or less sugar into our solution, its specific gravity will change. And so the hydrometer allows us to calculate uh, 
the sugar concentrations that are present in a solution. And then the next uh, apparatus that we used, or the instrument, was a mass flow meter. And so we hooked up a, an active uh, yeast culture into a fermenter to a mass flow meter. And what this mass flow meter does is it records the thermal conductivity of whatever air is passing through it. And what this does is it allows it to determine the concentration of carbon dioxide that is present in addition to the volumetric flow rate of this stream. And so we are able to get a numerical value for the flow rate of carbon dioxide that is being produced over time by our fermenter. Next, we use a spectrophotometer to figure out what the cell concentration is that is present in our solution uh, in order to meet our objective. And so the way a spectrophotometer works is we will shine a light through a lens and uh, we want to analyze only a single wavelength. In this experiment, we analyzed the 600 nanometer wavelength and we will shoot that light through a cuvette, which has a known band length, uh, typically in this case, it was one centimeter. And we will analyze the intensity of the light that makes it through relative to the intensity of the light that does not. And with this value, what we were able to do is find a, an absorbance or an optical density that tells us how much light actually makes it through. And so the way this works is pretty intuitive. The more cells, the more stuff we have present in that cuvette, the more likely it is that an incoming light ray will be scattered and will not be in this uh, transmitted light intensity I sub T. And the consequence of this is that we have a less intense light leaving our solution if our solution is more concentrated, or in other words, if our solution has more cells, uh, the intensity of transmitted light will be lower. And so with this information, as well as manual cell counts that we analyzed via a hemocytometer, we were able to define calibration curves, standard curves that allow us to correlate the cell concentration to the adsorbance or the optical density uh, in our spectrophotometer. And this is a key part of this experiment or project because it allows us to very quickly and easily find out what the concentration of cells is from a very quick measurement, which is the um, optical density value. And finally, uh, another instrument that was used was a gas chromatographer. And chromatography involves the use of stationary and mobile phases and relies on the difference in affinity for particular molecules to uh, either or both the stationary and mobile phases. And what it gives us is a ratio of the uh, species concentrations. In this case, we were interested in finding out what percentage of ethanol was in our aqueous solution. So we were interested in finding out what the ratio of ethanol to water was. And uh, so this summarizes the methods that were used. And uh, to go deeper into how we're actually processing this data, this experiment involved three parts. In part A, we used our hemocytometer to determine uh, standard curves. We also found the dry weight of the cells after we had dried them. Um, and with that information, as well as the optical density from our spectrophotometer, we were able to figure out the calibration curves or the standard curves that allow us to correlate adsorbance, ad absorbance to the concentration. In part B, we used this, these calibration curves to determine the concentration of three flasks that we seeded with varying concentrations of ethanol, I'm sorry, with varying concentrations of yeast. We then fermented each of those three flasks and all three of these flasks had roughly the same concentration of sugar. So the variable that we are changing is only the initial cell concentration. And after we fermented, uh, for a period of approximately 40 to 48 hours, we determined the new cell concentration via um, these calibration curves from part A. We performed gas chromatography to find the alcohol by volume percentage. And we also used a hydrometer, which I discussed in the introduction, to determine what the sugar concentration is that was present.
And with these three pieces of information, we were able to define yield coefficients that are useful in our Minode kinetics equations. And to continue the uh, data processing in part C of this experiment, uh, we again fermented another flask. We recorded the carbon dioxide levels uh, or the carbon dioxide mass flow rate over time. And from that value, using uh, correlations uh, found by Balling and others at et, et al., uh, we were able to fight, figure out what the ethanol concentration was, the cell count, and the sugar concentration that was present during this period of time in which it was fermenting. In addition, uh, we needed to incorporate the yield coefficients that we found. And what this allowed us to do was create plots that allowed us to find what the Minode constant Ks is and what mu max is. And Ks is a value that is equivalent to uh, the substrate, in this case glucose, composition when the growth rate, mu, is equivalent to one half mu max. And we we're also able to find mu max from uh, these plots. And finally, we turn to a math mathematical model that we created using MATLAB's ODE45 function to determine the sensitivity of all these variables uh, in our fermentation processes. And then we compared uh, the theory to our experimental evidence. And so what we ended up finding from our optical density measurements was that when we're relying on the concentration and the absor absorbance or optical density, Beer's law, which is what is the underlying mathematical model, was a very reliable way to allow us to do this. As we can see by this data, this trend line fits within the uh, uncertainties, these error bars, uh, while the optical density is between 0 0.1 and 1. And optical density is a unitless value. It has arbitrary units. Um, however, when we looked at how cell count correlates to the cell weight, uh, the data that we observed was, uh, was much more imprecise and the trend line did not match up with our uh, uncertainties when we set a zero intercept. When we have no cells present, we expect to have no optical density or um, no cells uh, per mil nanoliter. And the reason for this is performing cell counts introduces a lot of uncertainty into our measurements. Uh, counting cells under a hemocytometer, especially when we are dealing with higher numbers of cells, introduces the uh, likelihood that someone will miscount or double count or forget to count uh, cells that are present on these trays. And so uh, that was a key issue that was leading to the uh, impreciseness of this data that we're seeing. Um, and so coming around to the results, that we observed, we see that as yeast entered the growth phase, they did in fact consume the glucose that was present in the solution. We have the levels of glucose as they're dropping over time because the yeast are metabolizing them and forming ethanol and carbon dioxide via ethanol fermentation, as well as the number of cells that are being produced. And the way we derived this data was by uh, looking at the carbon dioxide and correlating it to biomass and uh, performing mass balances that let us uh, reach these kinds of conclusions. And the, the Minode constant that we found was 60.7 grams per liter, uh, as well as a uh, maximum specific growth rate mu max of 0 0.2 per hour. And so a uh, key analysis to take away from the data that we observed or calculated was the difference in uh, the theory when we take into account this toxicity level. So in traditional Minode kinetics, when uh, K, you typically get plots that look like this when you have a substrate composition uh, or concentration versus the growth rate, the more substrate you give the cells access to, the more these cells will be able to divide more quickly, 
and uh, typically we would have expected a much lower growth rate. But what we observed in lab was that because this ethanol was building up over time, it was preventing the cells from um, appropriately being able to form uh, many metabolic reactions in order to thrive. And consequently, these cells did not exhibit the same behavior. And this is because ethanol is toxic as it builds up. In addition to, we started the cells. Uh, the reason why we see such high numbers on the far right with our observed graph is that uh, the cells had um, access to m as much glucose as they could possibly want. Uh, and there was very little ethanol present. But as the cells continue to divide, if we analyze the time evolution in this graph, we're actually moving to the left. Um, the ethanol is increasing, and this results in more cells dying or not being able to be as active as they otherwise would be. And so to wrap up this presentation, what we found was that our yeast did, in fact, enter the growth phase and metabolize glucose via ethanol fermentation when we put them in a flask that had an absence of oxygen. Ethanol levels became toxic because uh, the yeast were producing ethanol as a consequence of ethanol fermentation, and this became toxic and prevented the cells from being as metabolically active as they other otherwise would be. Much less ethanol was produced than theoretically possible based on what Balling would predict in his mathematical models. And this is because these yeast cells are not only using glucose to, for ethanol fermentation, they have other requirements such as dividing and all the biomass that's required for dividing, as well as the fact that all of the sugar that was present in our solution wasn't necessarily dextrose, which is the D form of glucose, which is the form that glucose can actually ferment via ethanol fermentation and generate ethanol. And so because of this, we saw much lower uh, rates of conversion than what, we, than what we would have otherwise expected. In addition, the cell counts via the hemocytometer uh, introduce a lot of imprecision into our data. I would recommend using a an automated uh, cell counter with uh, perhaps more accuracy, as well as taking into account the dead cells that are present. And finally, spectrophotometry is a very good way that allows us to determine cell concentration uh, within reason in our solution. And so this wraps up the presentation. I hope you guys find this useful. Let me know if you have any questions, and thanks for watching.